to see you all here and uh, it's just a, it's a beautiful day outside, it's perfect weather. If you're watching online, good morning and welcome to church today and it's great to see you also online here as well. So it's going to be a great time, so uh, enjoy wherever you are, whether you be in the lounge room, uh, whether you be on the way here, still tuning into YouTube on the way as you drive, that could be a, that could be a thing too, I don't know. Um, and we've got a bunch of people here today as well for the first service. We've got two more, two morning services which are going to be amazing today. Uh, Peter Telford is speaking today, which is going to be great, and we're going to have a great time just using song to worship God. How many know that every single day and every minute of our life is worship? All right, our whole life is worship. That is the absolute truth of the matter. And sometimes we get to use songs to be able to do that. Sometimes we get to use music. And, and expression to be able to um, help us do that along the way and perhaps even recalibrate uh, that, that journey of worship. And, and some of us kind of might have been used to only having a four-bar intro to some of our worship expressions for the week. Maybe we haven't thought of worship all that much through the week in our day-to-day, -day, but maybe this is a moment where God recalibrates us in order to refocus on where we're going for the week ahead. I left a bit of a cliffhanger last week in the preaching. And we looked at Hebrews chapter 4, and we were reminded about um, just having a, a, a high priest who, is, uh, who, is, who, who empathizes fully with our weaknesses. And we're, we then taught, told to, let, to approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Uh, whatever need we're in, whatever position we are finding ourselves in this morning, God is present. The throne of grace is present. We've been talking about the Ark of the Covenant, which was a very Israel-centric thing, but we understand that the Ark in, in the Old Testament is better presented to us as God's throne now, God's throne of grace. And we have access to that. Uh, we can come boldly this morning. And we can approach at His grace and find it we can find our help, continue to look up, and we're going to worship the Lord today. So uh, why don't we stand, and let's, uh, let's uh, worship the Lord.
Jesus, I see it for all that you've done for me. Lord, we just proclaim that. We advertise that. We declare praise out of these words we've just sung. We, we come to you, our risen King, the one who conquered the grave and is present here amongst us in the praises of your people. We declare that in faith. We believe that in our hearts. We know that you are here with us today. We give you glory in all things. We're going to take a moment. Why don't we do a few fist bumps and say hi to a few people around the place. Anyway. Let us uh, grab our seats, shall we? I just, um, to those online, I just wanted to, um, I just put a bit of a comment. Uh, you know, we've got a few, a few of our guys commenting from in here to you guys. So definitely make yourselves known. If you're watching, tuning in today, we'd love to know. And uh, my little comment, you know, fist bumps to you guys also. So uh, welcome to church this morning to our online crew. We uh, just a few announcements because guess what? Tomorrow is March. Yeah. All right, so I, I just wanted to shock us all into into that. I'm sorry, um, but there's a bulletin that's gotten around there. Thanks to whoever caught those and folded them, um, and so that's that's awesome. Uh, now we we're coming into March, and these next couple of weeks are really. Um, uh, important weeks for us. Uh, we have a baptism service coming up on the 14th of March, uh, which is really important in the life of us as a church. I mean, we've got it on the to on the door for a reason. You know, Baptist Church, right? Um, it's a it's a major sacramental thing for us, and it's something we do not take lightly. Um, I've communicated this in recent times. I don't believe in doing sacraments with strangers. All right, communion, um, baptism. These are things we do not do here with strangers. They're things we do with family with believers together community and and this is a really major step that we do as a as a church and it's part of our discipleship journey if you are um if you are identifying as a member of christ's church if you identify with his sufferings and and know that he is the lord of your life and you've forsaken all other things and if you, if, you, if you know that he is calling you to discipleship and you're going, this is my next natural step, then uh, we'd like to invite you to be part of this service. We have two services booked for that day. We've got the 9 o'clock and the 11. It's going to be very interesting because we only are limited to a certain amount of people in here and there's going to be guests, so we're going to have to juggle this quite carefully. 
But the second service is definitely available for baptisms at this time. So if you're watching online as well, if you're thinking about coming in for 11 o'clock, uh, we have slots for baptism in that space also. And we would like to invite um, all. We've been a year since the last one. It will almost be a year to the day from the one last baptism service we had, which was just before lockdown, uh, to the one we're about to have this week, the, in the next couple of weeks, which will be a, a celebratory thing. I'm looking forward to that. And if we, I, I'm imagining there's more than a couple of people putting their hand up for that. So um, if you're one of those people, come and see me quickly, okay? You probably have to come to me now so that I can plan for that. So uh, get in touch with me as quick as you can so that we can get you into that process and back to you into the service. And uh, that would be a wonderful thing. And if you are thinking of it, don't think any longer. Let's do it. So we have the baptism service the day before. To make the place look good for our guests coming in. And, and, um, and so for people getting baptized, going, gee, I feel good about this place. We're going to do a working bee before that. So how's that for a segue? <laughs> um, but but there's a, a work, there, is a, uh, there is a working bee happening on Saturday the 13th of March. And we just want to um, just you know, do some, some stuff that needs to be done around the place. And um, Luke Harper here will be the guy to, to, um, to sort of lead the charge bit to talk. Yeah, just if you need to know times and info, just talk to him. And, um, and then we'll obviously, there'll be a team of us planning what's going to happen. But you know, just in terms of times and what to do, what to bring, just you know, tools and whatnot, he might be a good point of contact. Now, a little bit closer now, okay, those are the major things I don't want you to forget about. Um, and we also have uh, the church AGM at the end of uh, March on the 28th, and I believe notice will start being handed out for that tomorrow as well. So just giving you advance notice of that, March 28th at 4 p.m. so that our Korean people can be part of that as well. So we've uh, allowed for all members uh, that time slot is open so that all members can actually attend if they're free. And now, so uh, a little bit closer in the week to come. Um, this Friday, men, and in fact this weekend, men, um, we have... A, a advance notice for the uh, Babies With Your Bros event, which is Friday night, and instead of going to a pub like we sometimes do, um, Simon has extended his place. Uh, so that's right, have I got that right? Yep, Simon has, has said his place is the location of this particular Friday. And uh, so men, if you, um, you know, we, so from 5.30 onwards, um, if you want to be part of that, gather around with other men, uh, that's gonna be a great gathering. And also Saturday morning is our men's breakfast event. And, um, you know, for some of us, bacon is a good selling point. Um, people like me, bacon is not, but the Word of God is. And fellowship with other believers is. And no matter what it is that attracts you, be there. Okay, it's going to be an amazing time. The last one was really good with Steve Woods. We also had some friends come from Millicent Baptist as well. And we know that that relationship is developing and going to get stronger as well. So it's, gonna, it's a really good thing, a fellowship linking up with other churches as well. So uh, just keep those on your radar. And, um, and men, make space for those things. And uh, we can, otherwise, so many other things going on through the week. You've got your house churches, we've got all these other things. God is doing great things around our midst. And uh, so if you are disconnected throughout the course of the week, well, talk to me because we can make sure that that, is, um, that can be fixed. So because we have a motto, that we have a standard that nobody stands alone. And we want to make sure that nobody in our fellowship stands alone. So just uh, make note of those. The bulletin is there for us to make note of those dates and uh, God will do some great things in all of those times. Now, we're going to um, take some time just to pray for our offering. Um, we don't obviously give out our offering anymore through bags and that sort of thing. It's a new era. Um, our online deets should be on the screen shortly so that we can, um, if you are using this time now to get your phone out and do a bit of a transfer, feel free. If you're online and watching in, you can use this as well. Um, if you prefer the cash method, we have a black box over there by where Tony Potter's sitting and he's doing his hand modeling right now. And um, he missed his calling, he's a nurse. But, you know, <laughs> so, but um, yeah, it's like it's a part time job, isn't it? So, um, and you can give there. The white envelopes are for missions focuses, the yellow ones are, are for regular giving into the life of the church. And uh, speaking of uh, missions giving, um, we had a great, uh, we had a great uh, fundraiser on, on uh, Friday night for our friends at uh, Cordially Hope Bible College and so some fundraising there. So you can continue to give to that course and it's their building fund for their Bible College wing and um, it's, it's a privilege to be able to partner with those guys at this time. It's good to be able to be, play a part in training young Korean leaders that, it, with the gospel, young Korean ministers because what's going on over there right now is going to need good leadership in the afternoon. 
And if we can play our role in, in facilitating that, even just a little bit, even with a bit of finance, and even some online training and different things that we're doing, uh, we can actually see young leaders arise, go back to villages, be part of the rebuild process that is gonna take place in our nation once democracy and all these things come back. And uh, so these guys are um, definitely the, the real deal and they're passionate about their pl their, where they, what they are called to do. So um, yeah, we, we get a chance to really partner with that through this particular thing. And I'm gonna let, um, and Peter is preaching today and he has full permission to plug that as much as he wants through the sermon. Anyway, uh, so it's going to be, yeah, so just remember that as well. And remember the nation of Myanmar in our prayer at the time, all right? And the whole Baptist world right now, the, all, the entire Baptist alliances, all the different Baptist organizations around the world are united in prayer for that nation at this time. It's a, that's an unprecedented thing. We don't find that point of unanimity a lot. But in this case, the world is united in praying for this nation at the moment. And, um, and that can only bring about good. Yeah, so let's continue to do that. So let's uh, pray. Jesus, we acknowledge your presence here. We acknowledge your power. We acknowledge how great you truly are. You are Lord of all things. We completely trust you. We trust you with our presence. We trust you with our concerns and our cares. We lean into the invitation to cast the full weight of our concerns on you as you care for us. We lay it all down at your feet today. And even in this season that we have been in, we even lay down the concerns of our finance at your feet also. We know that we can look up even when we, we can sit there and thinking of that particular issue of our lives. And we trust you there also with our provision, with our finance. You have been faithful through the year. You've been present and we thank you. And we thank you for what you do to provide for us. And even as we give today, we acknowledge that this is only in response to the fact that you are the one who gives, gives power to get wealth. And we acknowledge that this morning with thanks, with grateful hearts. And even an element of trust in part of our income that may feel like a stretch of time. We are thank you for all you are doing. We bless your name. And nothing about our lives is off limits. I pray for those today who have concerns in their hearts. Some are grieving. And I pray for your presence to be in their life. Right Some are worried. And I pray that your presence will be in there, will be strong in them also. Our Korean brothers and sisters are deeply concerned about the nation of Myanmar right now. We bring that nation to you. We join with all the Baptists around the world and all the other churches and all the other ministries that are united in prayer around this one neighbor right now, around this one location, in a way that I've not seen before. And I pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that the nation of Myanmar would be subject to the hand of Jesus, King Jesus. That dictatorships would fall. Military strongholds and military powers would fall. That leaders that you appoint would arise. And that the church in this nation of Myanmar, in all of its states, would remain strong at this time and they would stay on their knees, trusting you from the position of Shiloh and not of their knees. I pray you will do wondrous things amongst the believers of that nation. I pray you'll be present across all the borders right now. We know even yesterday there was a boatload of Rohingya who were, who were stranded at sea. We pray for an out, a, a good outcome for them. We think of all the refugee camps along the thai Burma border who will be inundated with new people in these weeks to come. And the people in Bangladesh and others who will be, uh, who will be receiving these also on the other side. And I pray 
that there will be safe passage and a place of safety for these people to find. And if it be your will, even a new home. We pray for your presence in all of that. And sometimes we don't even know exactly what to pray for, but you know all things. So what we don't know to pray for, we give it to you, Jesus, and we trust you for what you are doing in the world today. We commit all things. Give you glory. And as we're about to sing, even if we don't have the answers, even if we haven't had the need met immediately, we know your presence is here. And even in the midst of the trial, you are present. And we trust that also. In Jesus' name. I said I would teach you a new song this week. And this is actually something that I've, um, uh, it's a, one of those unusually searching songs. And um, it was written during lockdown last year, and it was written by one of my favourite worship bands ever. And uh, I just thought it was a really powerful thing, and it came across really well in our worship time, in our practice times a few weeks back. And Dale just said, let rip again, let's bring it out for the church. So it's going to... Just remain seated for this part while we catch this. Um, let me teach you this new song. I've never asked these questions. I've never felt so broken. Oh God, what do I do now? I've never cried this way I've never seen such pain Oh God, what do I do now? But even here Even now I lift my eyes to heaven And remember I am loved I lift these weary hands and let my father pick me up more than answers more than healing God your presence is enough I lift my eyes to heaven and remember you're still where my help comes from let's stand together all my fears came true but then I'll match for you. Oh God, come and hold me now. And be my prince of peace. And share my suffering. Oh God, come and hold me now. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember I the broken heart and you are here with me you take my sorrow inside your hands you turn it to victory if you are near to the broken heart then you are here with me you take my sorrow inside your hands and turn it to victory I've never asked these questions I've never felt so broken. Oh God, what do I do now? I lift my eyes to heaven and remember I am loved. I lift these weary hands and let my Father pick me up. More than answers, more than healing, God, your presence is enough. I lift my eyes to heaven and remember you're still where my 
my help comes from You're still where my help comes from You're still where my help comes from Christ is enough.
We look to you, Jesus. No turning back. No matter what happens, your presence is enough. And we are following. No turning back. We open our hearts to what the Spirit is going to say to the church through your word. We turn our ear to the Spirit now. We give you space, King Jesus, to minister, to speak into our, into our lives, to meet us where we're at, to challenge us, to grow us, to, to build us in this time. And I pray for your anointing on this servant Pete as he uh, comes and shares what you've shown him to bring to us today. And we commit him to you. We commit ourselves with open hearts to you as we come to here in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, church. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not on yet. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? I, I can't hear me. There. That's better. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Cam. As we continue on our series today with um, First Samuel, looking at, at uh, Israel's first king, King Saul. Before I do, I will just plug this. We had a great night, Friday night, with the quiz night, and uh, we raised a lot of money. I won't tell you the figure yet, because you may not be finished. So I thought I'd give the opportunity for people Sunday to, if you want to put uh, anything in there or a pledge, if you like, if you haven't come prepared, if you do put a pledge, make sure you put your name and phone number so I can chase you up. But um, if you like the opportunity, uh, it's, it's there today. Thank you. Okay, we want a king. We want a king. Saul, we knew him as the bad king, didn't we? We always know him as the bad king. But I just thought we'd uh, have some... TV first. Um. <laughs> what an ugly looking creature, eh? This, this little man is called a blobfish. It's very imaginative. He's actually a native. He's, he's an Australia, off the east coast of Australia in New Zealand. Very deep sea fish. Poor fella. This guy is the red-lipped batfish. <laughs> he can be found on, off the Galapagos Islands or off, off the coast of South America. Another unfortunate mistake, isn't it? This is the Marabu, uh, get me here, the Marabu stork found in southern, Africa, southern Sahara in Africa. Isn't he attractive? <laughs> this will put you off your tea. This is the naked mole rat in East Africa. Aren't they special specimens? And when I look at those things, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously God has made a mistake. Don't you think? We look at that and we think, where did he go wrong? And clearly, um, as we remember Saul today, I'll get off that. That'll... As we remember Saul today as the bad king, we think of um, a God who when he creates or appoints or does something, in his foreknowledge he knows the future, he knows what's to come, and yet there are times when you wonder, why did he bother if he knew what's coming? If he knew the failings that were coming, he knew the mistakes, why did he continue? And yet, knowing exactly what would happen when he appointed king, uh, Saul as king, knowing that his leadership would be a complete failure, knowing that he would take others with him on that failure... God still continued. So why did God make a mistake? Did he make a mistake? 
We'll get, we'll get into some scripture now. We'll read First Samuel. Uh, this is going to come back on again. Are we on? Yes, there we go. First Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 to 2. So there was a Benjaminite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becheroth, and other names that you're going to remember next week. <laughs> Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome as a name, the handsome as young man as you could find anywhere in Israel, and he was sort of head taller than anywhere, anyone else. Uh, we won't read everything in this story because it's such a long uh, passage. We'll just get to the, the crux of it. When, when we get to know Saul and his servant, we, we first get to know him. He's walking around the countryside looking for his father's lost livestock. His donkeys have jumped the fence. They've gone wandering down the road. And here he's, he's, he's in his servant. He's trying to find them. Now, nothing brings rural people together like when your cows get on the road, I promise you. Um, eventually, eventually, they think, you know, him and his servant, Saul and his servant, think, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll go and see the seer. We'll go and see the prophet, the seer, S W -E R. And what would be normal is you'd, you'd pay the seer some money. He'd sort of do a read your palms or whatever he's got to do, find out where the, the lost animals are and tell you. That's how it worked. Remember that the culture of the time, and we see this in Saul, they sought God when it suited them. That's how it worked. But eventually they find Samuel, and Samuel has been hearing from God all the time, and Samuel says to Saul, um, or God says to Samuel, this man that's come to you is your next king. So we're just going to backtrack a little bit. And we, we look back at last week and we recap something. We'll see here in 1 Samuel uh, that God was reluctant to appoint a king at all. It wasn't against the idea. We know that in books previous to, to, to 1 Samuel, you know that um, uh, God was, had planned to appoint a king. He, he prophesied that there would be a, a king coming along. And we know that uh, the whole point, the whole narrative of this is leading up towards a king named Jesus eventually. So God isn't against the idea of king. He just wanted people to recognise him as king first. That's all it was. And we read early on in this conversation with Samuel, when, when God's speaking with Samuel, and early on as we've, we've looked over the last couple of weeks, and you can, there is a passage there you can almost hear God's heart breaking. When he says the words, they, they, the people, have rejected me as king, so just give them what they want. And the heart condition of the Israelite people, I think, can be summed up in the, actually the end of Judges, before Samuel, where it says, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. In other words, they recognise the lordship of no one. So what happens? You become lords to yourself. Something that sort of sounds familiar for me today, like our culture today. If you, if you don't recognise absolute truth, we will eventually develop our own sense of truth, what we think is right or wrong. And when that scenario is played out to its final outcome, we reject God and become gods ourselves. I love that quote that Chris gave the other week. Saul bowed the knee occasionally, but David worshipped. And it's true, Saul did bow the knee occasionally, but the fact is also that the entire nation of Israel bowed the knee occasionally. They worshipped God when they suited, it, suited them. If you like, Saul was kind of the, the average sample of the nation. And we see this time and time again through Judges, and we see last week with Cam's preaching, Israel had rejected their king king as in they rejected God as their king but they didn't remove him completely and in the culture of Israel at the time we see um, 
God is treated just like one of the others. We have the Baals, we have the Astaroths, we have, and, and God's just there in the mix. He's one of the, one of the group. Covering all bases. They worshipped God when it suited their purpose, as we heard last week. And, and they treated God, and we, particularly the Ark of the Covenant, like some sort of lucky charm. You know, like, that, like a plastic dashboard Jesus. You just prop it up there and you'll be right. It'll cover you. We'll give this a go. And they run off to war and we'll, we'll give this a go because nothing else is working. And we remember from last week they suffered the, one of the worst of Israel's defeats of all time. But at the end of the day, they did carry the Ark of God into battle, didn't they? They did bring the, the presence of God into battle. So now you have to ask the question then, if God was there, where did God go wrong? Where did God make his mistake? So God reluctantly appoints a king called Saul. And I say reluctantly, but not half-heartedly. He did it properly, not half-heartedly. As we go through this process, step by step of Saul's appointment, we, we can see how it almost mirrors that of David's appointment in years to come. And whilst we know how it affected the heart of God, how people had rejected God as king and they wanted another king, whilst, whilst we know that, God did still not appoint Saul like some sort of sulky child. Who's some, some kid who's had his feelings hurt. He, he, he did it properly. He anointed Saul properly. The only, God, the only way God works. So as we go through this, I want you to keep your, your spiritual peripheral vision going, okay? You know what that is? Your peripheral vision, so you're staring straight ahead, you can, I can still see my hand about there. You know what's going on around you. Keep your spiritual peripheral vision going because you will notice it's a, a remarkable similarity of how Saul is appointed king as how you and I came to Christ. So the, step, the first step we come to is God finds Saul, not the other way around. God found us, not the other way around. Saul had no clue or inkling he was going to become king. He was just walking around the countryside looking for his dad's donkeys that jumped the fence. And so, so he, he uh, think we'll figure out, we'll go, we'll go see the prophet. He'll tell us where the, where the donkeys are. God, it's God that found us and it's God that found Saul. And I figure what we'll do, we'll, we'll find Samuel, he's the seer, he'll, he'll know what to do, we'll pay him some money, he'll find us the donkeys and we'll go on our way, it'll all be simple. But when they get to, to Samuel first, we know that God has got to Samuel ahead of time and he says, this guy is your, your king and uh, he starts the process. And I don't know about you, but so far, after step one, God finds Saul. I, I can't find where God's made a mistake. I still can't find it. Maybe it's coming up. Maybe it's coming up. So we get on to our next scripture, 1 Samuel 10.1, when Samuel takes a flask of oil, of olive oil, and pours it on, his, on Saul's head, and then kisses him. Really? Uh, it's, has, has not, he's saying, has not the Lord anointed you as ruler over his inheritance? So we find step one, God has found Saul. And step two, he's his anointed Saul. God anoints him. Samuel takes Saul aside and says, oh, Saul, uh, God has anointed you king over Israel. Come a bit closer so I can tip this bucket of oil on your head. It's going to run down all through your hair, through your beard, on your clothes. Later on, the dust and the flies will stick to it. And that's how you know God's with you. And we know, well, later on, we get, um, with Saul, it's a jug of oil. With, with David, later on, it's a ram's horn. There's big ram's horns they have, filled with oil. We know it's a couple of litres, at least. It's going to get through you. So it's dribbling all over. And, and then Samuel wants to kiss him. Uh, do it the other way around. I'm glad, does, I'm glad God doesn't work that way. 
anymore. And that's how you know that God is on your side. And we know, we know there's more of a spiritual significance going on here. There's more than just oil. It's the Old Testament picture of the Holy Spirit. And what it's saying is, Saul, now you've been anointed, you will no longer live and work in your own strength. Now you will use, you will operate in God's strength only. You will live life in the power of God because of this anointing. And it's the same with us. When we come to Christ and there is this spiritual anointing, the Holy Spirit comes into our, our, takes residence within us and now we operate in God's strength, not our own. And I'm not talking about you know, the power to be a great leader or a king or a, a politician or something. It's, we, we don't talk about this enough, actually. When the Holy Spirit comes in our lives as Christians, it's simply the power in our lives to do what God has called us to do. And that anointing that Saul received was not just physical but spiritual as well. We'll go to the next, next piece of scripture here in verse 9 to 11. As, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed his heart. So there's evidence that this anointing is more than just oil running over your head. It's a spiritual change, it's a renewal. And all these signs were fulfilled that day and he and his servants arrived at Gibeah. A procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he joined in their prophesying. And when all those who had formerly known Saul said, him, Saul said, said um, so when prophesying with the prophets, they asked, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Apparently this is our bad king, Saul, that we're all, we all know. God found Saul. God anointed Saul and I still can't find where God has made a mistake. Can you? So God finds Saul, God anoints Saul. The next step we see he appoints Saul. It's fine to say God found me and it's fine to say he anointed me but when, when you're appointed for something it's where the rubber hits the road. It's where you actually get on to do what it is that God has called you to do. And the question that we ask of ourselves, will, will others know that I've been found, that God has found me and he's anointed me? Will others know? Will others know that God has anointed me to do this job? In verse 23, chapter 10, verse 23, they, they ran out, they ran and brought him, this is at the coronation now, they ran out and brought him and stood, among, stood him among the people. He was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see this man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then all the people shouted, Long live the king. Not long after this, there's, there's a war, as there often is. And Saul comes to the rescue of a, of a town under siege and people everywhere start to see what Saul already knows, that here's the man anointed, chosen, anointed and appointed to be our king. And I still can't find where God got it wrong. Where did he make a mistake? We know the story about Saul from here on goes downhill pretty quickly. So where did God go wrong? Later on, Saul is at one of his many battles. The, the standard procedure in this time is that before the battle, you get the prophet to come along. He inquires of God for you. He does some sacrifices and then you'll know if you're going to be successful in the battle. You'll know if it's God's will. If it, you know, it's, it's good practice to ask God first where you're going. Will God bless our endeavour? But Samuel is, is due to turn up and do that. But he's running late. Actually, he's not late at all. If you read this passage carefully, he says he'll, he'll be there in seven days. He turns up late in the afternoon on the seventh day. 
We do that with God all the time, don't we? We, we say, God's late, we need to step in and do something because he's not getting organised. This is the exact soul, that back problem that Saul made in this passage. In Samuel, 1 Samuel 13, from, from, chapter five, from verse 5, the Philistines came to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, the soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth-Avon. When the Israelites saw their situation was critical and their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks, the pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. But Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. So, so Saul's men began to scatter. And Saul began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offerings. And just as he finished doing that, Samuel arrived. Not late, just, just on time. Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I... When we read this, notice the amount of times Saul says the word I. It's a clue in what's going wrong. Saul replied, when I saw the man was was scattering and that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at, at Michmash, I thought... Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favour so I felt compelled to offer the burnt sacrifice. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord God, Lord God has given you. If you have, you would have established your kingdom for, over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And appointed him ruler of the people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. So as quick as it came, Saul loses his appointment. And what seems to be a small sin, really, over this this little sacrifice, apparently, is such a big deal. The problem was that Saul's behaving in in this story exactly the same as Israel had been behaving for generations. And they still keep making this mistake. And they still haven't learned. The lesson that Samuel's been trying to drum into Saul and all of Israel, that unless we do God's will first, everything else will fail. And they kept banging up against this the whole time. Saul wanted to do things his way, in his time, and how he liked. Even a king has authority over him. Regardless of what authority you think you have on earth, there will always be someone in authority over you. And nothing has changed over 3,000 years. If we keep doing things our way, if we, the way we want in our own time, by our own will, then we become gods to ourselves and we create our own sense of truth. And we fail. How did God make the mistake? He's blamed for all this stuff, isn't he? He's blamed for it. He didn't make a mistake. We did. We have this saying on the farm that there is always one. You know what I'm talking about? When you've got cattle or sheep, you try and run them through a gateway or something and then there's, the saying is there's always one. Because most of them, a hundred or something, will find the gate and go through, and except one will go their own plan. I remember a time I was doing that in in our block down the coast. I was shifting this herd of cattle through the through the gate, and they're all flowing through, all knowing, following their mate, all knowing what to do. But there's always one, and the last one decided there's the gates here, and there's a fence either side, and all the rest flowed through the gateway, and this one went up there, looked at the gateway, looked at its mates and then shot up the fence that side. And because I got a good dog, I, I sent, a, sent him around him, down the, the heifer, turned it around, brought her back, she ran all the way past the gateway back up that side. 
So he took off. I had a good dog at the time. He knew what was going on. He knew where she was supposed to be. So he took off up there again, turned around, turned, turned the heifer around. She ran past the gateway all back up the other way around. <laughs> I kid you not, this happened six times. <laughs> Until eventually the heifer got so exhausted and bewildered, she decided, I'm just going to join my mates. I'll jump the fence. So she jumps the fence, drags the back legs over the barbed wire. Isn't that easier? There is always one. And I have to think, how many times have I done that? How many times have we done that with God? That His way is set before us, but we've got to do our own thing, we've got to run our own way, and we end up making it hard for ourselves and everyone else. Jesus told us how to pray. He said, pray like this. He said, pray our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Not ours. Hallowed be your name. He said, your kingdom come, not anyone else's. Your kingdom come. And then he said, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, your will be done everywhere. It can be a scary thing to do, to pray to God those words, Lord, your will be done in my life today and every day. Because when we pray like that, we think in the back of our minds, God will take us somewhere we don't want to go or make us do something we don't want to do. I'll have to give up my dreams and I'll have to give up my plans. So we hang on to some stuff. We don't give everything to God. Now, I've got to say, I haven't been perfect in this. In fact, it's taken me years to figure this stuff out, but... Uh, I have figured out eventually the only way to live, God, live this life is to say those words, God, have your way done in my life every day, today and every day. And I found that I haven't had to give up my plans at all. I found that they've happened in God's time and his will just because I put them aside and said your, your will first. What I've discovered is that God has his way and my plans work out anyway. In fact, my plans have usually worked out to exceed my expectations. I remember years ago, Chris and I were newlyweds. We, we, uh, had, had, we lived in town. Our grand plan for our lives, I have to laugh at it now, a grand plan for our lives, we wanted to live in a house out in the country with a couple of acres. I was thinking too small, clearly. God's plan was much bigger. But all it takes is that surrender. Everything I am, I give to you. Your will be done in my life every day. You are my Lord and you are my King. He does take us out of our comfort zone when we say that. He will take us some places we need to trust him. But there is freedom in God's will. There's also safety in God's will. He stops me doing a lot of stupid things. I don't have to be that heifer running backwards and forwards trying to find the gate. The, God doesn't make mistakes. We do. And the best way to short-circuit our mistakes is to pray those words every day, Lord, your will be done as it is in heaven doesn't mean we stop praying for all our hopes and dreams and we give up on all that. It just means that they come second and we place God first in our lives and sovereign. And if Saul had done that, we would be here today talking about his lineage, not David's that we'll talk about next week. If he had just placed God first in everything he did, we'd be talking about him. Maybe you're new here. Maybe, Maybe this is your first time in church and you're new to this faith and this church stuff. I want to tell you that God has not made a mistake with you. So many times in our lives we make mistakes just because the silly things we've done, our own mistakes. Because we did it our way. That worship of us, that self-focus of us always leads to a dead end. When life is all about me and 
my way, it, it just ends up killing us. There is a remedy. God, your will be done in my life today and every day. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. What we haven't seen yet, and we'll see down in this series, is where this self-centred determination of Saul's will lead him to. In the end, it will lead him seeking guidance through witchcraft. If we keep following our own stubborn will to its very end, we will end in death. It will end in a dead end. We we will be that heifer that runs past the gate and back and forwards and back and forwards until we end up hurting ourselves. If we'd just done God's will in the first place and run through the gate, we'd be okay. There are two choices in this life. It's your way or God's will. Let's pray. Lord, we want to confess to you today the amount of times we have stubbornly tried to go our own way in our own plans. And we ask for your forgiveness for how they've, those plans have led us to make dumb mistakes. Dumb mistakes we've sometimes blamed you for. Whether we're a Christian or not in this place, we, we pray these words in our hearts now. Lord, your will be done in my life and lead me to life. Lead me to a fulfilled life. I take all my plans, my hopes, my dreams, I place them second. And from today on, you will come first as we seek you with all our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand, shall we, church?
Jesus sovereign. Crown him in all things. All right, no matter what God does to elevate us in this life, remain subject to Christ and let him be sovereign in all that you do. Let's have an amazing week with Jesus as king. Let's follow his lead all week. And let's see what great things he does through us as we proclaim and demonstrate who he is to the world around us. God bless you. Have an amazing week in Jesus. Amen. Amen.